Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. We are in the worst epidemic that the United States has ever seen in its history. And by the time this is over with, it will have taken more lives than any other epidemic uh, maybe in the history of the world. Uh, so we're here to talk about that today, and hopefully everybody understands that. Uh, our story begins here with me. Uh, in 2003, I made an, uh, a, a conscious decision. I wanted to give something back to this community. Uh, and so I became a police officer. Uh, I joined the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office, uh, uh, and I became a member of their SWAT team. And one of our duties as a member of the SWAT team was to conduct something called high-risk warrants, basically drug raids. Uh, and I can tell you that on every drug raid we went into, we took a lot of cocaine out of people's houses. We took a lot of marijuana. We did do some pills like ecstasy, uh, methamphetamine, but never Never ever once did I see heroin, okay? And so I t tell you that story to flash forward to 2011, 2012 when I became the coroner, and all of a sudden we had five people in this community die of a heroin overdose. And that of course was alarming. So that's where the story begins and we'll jump in right here. So this is heroin. Heroin's an opioid painkiller. There's the fancy medical name for it. Uh, it is used recreationally and only recreationally because it creates a euphoric effect. However, its side effects include central nervous system and respiratory depression, and those are the two things that get you in trouble and lead you to death. Most of us, when we think about heroin, we think of the picture on the lower right corner, needle and spoon. Um, the picture on the left corner is some variants of heroin. Sometimes we see it in the black form, which calls black tar heroin. Other times it's in the white form, which sometimes is uh, considered more pure. But the most common way you see it is in that brown form. And people say, well, what do you mean by the brown form? And I describe it like this. It looks kind of like sand, okay? However, I will let you know it's more like, uh, it's not like Destin sand, it's more like Biloxi sand, okay? <laughs> so if anybody's here from Mississippi, then you really know what I'm talking about. So um, when we do post-mortem toxicology on individuals, we never, ever, ever find heroin in their system. And that's because the drug heroin rapidly metabolizes into this compound, 6-monolacetomorphine, or, or, or 6 man for short. And so what we're really looking for in these post-mortem uh, analysis is the 6 man. Uh, what's also very important is if you are exposed and have a heroin overdose, sometimes we find 6 man in your blood, but not your urine, and that gives us a clue that you died very rapidly, meaning it was a very quick fatal overdose. Other times we find 6 ma'am in your urine and not in your blood, which means you died very slowly, which means that the respiratory depression and so forth allowed your body an opportunity to filter that 6 ma'am from your blood into your urine. Uh, so that's what makes this a very important compound. The other thing that makes it a very important compound is the only thing that creates 6 ma'am is heroin. So if you find 6 ma'am, absolutely it was uh, related to a heroin uh, overdose. So. When we talk about uh, uh, drug overdoses or drugs in general, there are two pharmacological concepts that are incredibly important. One is called potency, and that has to do with the strength of the drug. So we all take an ibuprofen in here, 200 milligrams. It's gone through a process that says scientifically what's in that pill is 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. Okay? The reason that's important is because drug dealers don't go to the FDA and have their heroin tested, okay? despite what anybody might believe. So when a person who's addicted to this, uh, this drug purchases it, they have no idea what the potency is going to be. And we see it linger sometimes between 10% all the way up to 50%. So not knowing what they get, you can realize how much trouble they can get themselves into uh, when they ingest that drug. The second thing that's specific pharmacologically to opioids is the concept of tolerance. So everybody might have heard a scenario where somebody says, you know, I took an opioid pill from my doctor, just as they prescribed, and then I noticed that I needed a second one to make the pain better. And a couple of days later, that wasn't working, so I needed to get the doctor to write me one that was more, stronger, like a step up. And then that didn't work, and then I had to get a shot, because that was the next thing. That's the concept of tolerance. Now, there's tolerance in a lot of parts of pharmacology, but specifically when we talk about opioids, tolerance becomes a problem. Because when you become tolerant to an opioid, you need more and more and more of it to get the same effect. And you can understand the, the danger that exists in that when somebody starts to take more and more of an opioid that can cause them to stop breathing and ultimately die. 
So these two concepts play a very important role because two situations as the corner that I see are someone who has never used an opiate before, they try heroin for the first time, and they have a very quick fatal massive overdose as a result of it. Their body is essentially naive to the drug. The second phenomena is when I have an individual who has been taking the drug and has developed tolerance over a period of time. They go into rehab, they're no longer getting the opioid, their system resets to a naive level, and the next thing you know they go out and they begin to use again, and in their mind they use the same volume of drug they used previously, and all of a sudden there they have an overdose in that scenario. So those are the two most common situations we see uh, at the coroner's office. So let's look at the numbers here in East Baton Rouge Parish. Like I said, 2012, five heroin overdoses. The next year, 2013, 35 heroin overdoses, a seven-fold increase in one year. That was when I recognized we had a problem in our community, and that's when I began to make the community aware. Now you can see over time how these numbers have uh, kind of fluctuated up and down, but relatively speaking, they have continued to climb over the years, including 2018 where we had 44 deaths, which is essentially the, almost the same in 2017. What I'm going to put on top of that is all the remainder of the drug overdoses. And you can see how that is extended. Now these are not heroin overdoses, but these might also include opioids, people that take overdoses related to opioid prescriptions. And at the very top of each one of those little columns, there are people that overdose on stimulant drugs, stimulant drugs like cocaine or methamphetamine. We rarely see those compared to the opioid overdoses. So the opioids make up the majority of, uh, of overdoses in our community. And you can see from year to year how this has continued to climb. So as a good scientist, I had to ask myself, why? Why all of a sudden, after all the police raids, drug raids that I did as a police officer, never saw heroin, all of a sudden we have heroin in our community. How did this happen? And we traced it back to the following. First of all, in the early part of 2000, prior to 2000, if you got uh, uh, caught uh, for distributing heroin, or schedule, which is a Schedule One narcotic, you served life in prison. Okay? And does anybody know what life in prison means in Louisiana? It means life in prison. Simple as that. So, the Louisiana legislature at the time felt like we had too many non-violent drug offenders in jail. And I use that word uh, very specifically, too many non-violent drug offenders. And specifically, they were talking about people that sold Schedule I narcotics, okay? Of which heroin is one of them, but also included in that group is marijuana, LSD. I think the mistake they made here was is that they should have said, we have too many people selling marijuana in jail, okay? But by using the word Schedule I, they changed the law from it being a mandatory life sentence to going all the way to the bottom, which is five years in jail, okay? And in doing that, what did we do? We painted a picture on the state of Louisiana that says if you're a bad guy drug dealer, come sell your drugs here in Louisiana. We're open for business. And we invited the heroin dealer into our community. So that was the first problem. The second problem happened in 2010. This happened across the country where uh, in an order to prevent what we call drug diversion, or doctor shopping is another name for it, we invented something called the, the a prescription monitoring program. And this is a database that a prescriber can look at your prescription history, specifically your narcotic prescription history, and see if you're doctor shopping. You're going from one doctor to the next doctor to the next doctor to get these pills, to either use them or sell them on the street. And so when the prescription monitoring program took place and prescribers were then able to look in that system and maybe have a different conversation such as, I'm not going to write you a prescription for opioids, all of a sudden all those pills that were readily available on the street, by the way, you could get a lower tab for $1 per milligram, so that's 10 bucks if you got a lower tab 10, uh, all of a sudden became fewer and fewer pills on the street. And when there were fewer and fewer pills on the street, and you're addicted to opioids, you start looking for other types of opioids. And who did we invite to the state of Louisiana? The heroin dealer. And they were waiting on the sideline for this to happen. And so ultimately, that was the second step. After that, there's more of the why. Has anybody ever heard of the pain scale? Now this is an interesting thing to wrap your mind around. So, there was a pharmaceutical company called Pardue Pharma. You might have heard of them. Okay? They, sell, they created a very famous drug called OxyContin, by the way, which they told us is, doesn't have any complications and is a very safe drug and you can't get addicted to it. That's what they told the whole healthcare environment, uh, which was a, just a big lie, ultimately. But they also convinced the federal government that we were not, as clinicians, treating pain appropriately. And so they said, you know what, why don't we institute something called the pain scale? We're even going to call it the fifth vital sign. It's that important. And so when we know our vital signs, we talk about 
blood pressure, pulse, temperature, respiratory rate, the four regular vital signs, by the way, which are all scientifically calculated. And we added this fifth vital sign for you to tell me what your pain scale is or pick your little smiley face or your frowny face. <laughs> Completely subjective. So we added a subjective vital sign and then we force clinicians to respond to that vital sign. So the next thing you know, me as a clinician, I had to say, well, what's your pain? And you said it was a frowny face. And then I, and then I had to give you some Oxycontin. And that's essentially what we did. And unfortunately, because of this phenomena, it forced clinicians into the habit of treating a subjective number rather than looking at things that are objective or just treating the patient and having a, a, a regular uh, uh, a conversation with them. So kind of a unique thing that happened, I think, uh, and all led by the pharmaceutical industry. Bounced around with that was something called the patient satisfaction scores. Has anybody been to a, a, a clinic or a hospital recently? You get these surveys in the mail, how was your experience? And these are good things, don't get me wrong. There are certain questions you should ask. Like, as an ER doctor, I think you should be able to come to my emergency room and not lay in a bloody bed. I mean, that, we should clean the bed before we put a new patient in, right? Um, however, if I asked you this question and you're addicted to opioids, did they address your pain? Did you get pain-free, right? And you're addicted to it, and if I didn't give you any pain medicines, what are you going to do? You're going to ding me for being a bad clinician, right? And then if, if you turn around and you take this patient satisfaction score and you tie my reimbursement to it, what does that do? That kind of forces my hand. Now all of a sudden I'm going to say, well, I'm just going to get you high so that I don't get in trouble. And again, another issue that creates the problem that exists today. This, these things together created what I like to call the perfect storm. Right? We created an environment that created the opioid epidemic. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It happened over a long period of time. But it has led to what we have today. So the problem is, is we have to dig ourselves out of this, out of this uh, scenario and out of the perfect storm. So let's talk about a few things to, to note before we get into the solutions of the opioid epidemic. And those things are, you have to understand, we're talking about opioid and heroin. Opioid and heroin dealers are rarely heroin users. Okay? And I'll give you this example. I love warm glazed donuts. I do. Okay? I mean, so certainly people in the room probably do the same. I cannot own a donut shop. <laughs> because what would happen on Sunday, if you came to visit me on Sunday after church and be like, I like a dozen glazed, I'd say, ate them all. Okay? <laughs> so translate that to what we're talking about with heroin dealers. Okay? So, in two different, in two different in, in categories, you have people that deal the heroin and people that use the heroin. And so you have to delineate those two things in your mind because that's going to be how we solve this is by separating those two entities. Okay? Remember, the dealer is a businessman, sells drugs, want to make money. They don't care anything other than that. Okay? The user, on the other hand, is somebody who is medically and psychologically addicted to this medicine. They need our help. I refer to those folks as my patients, okay? Uh, so that's how we have to, to delineate the two in our minds uh, from a solution standpoint. So let's talk about the bad guy, the bad guy. These are the bad guys. These are the guys that bring this drug into this country. They come from Mexico, okay? They ship it in in, in big quantities. They want to make money. They're selling a product that's in high demand. The best sentence on this slide, they're looking for an environment with a high return on investment with minimal laws that make business risk averse. It sounds like Economics 101, and we're talking about drug dealing, okay? But that's what they do. Uh, they've also got very creative in their forms of distribution, right? Because a lot of us in the room might say, God, I don't know that I could inject myself with a needle. That would take a lot of guts to do that, right? Uh, if anybody's ever had to give themselves a shot, that's kind of a tough thing to do, right? Because you can't fool yourself like, I'm going to count to three and then go on two, because you kind of know you're going to go on two. So what they've done creatively is they've said, what if I took the heroin and I bought a pill press off of Amazon? Sir, please put your phone away. Not on Amazon. He's over there trying to buy a pill press. Over there. I'm just kidding. So, you can buy a pill press on Amazon, take that heroin, and press it into a pill. Now you sell it as a pill form, right? And so somebody who couldn't make that jump into shooting heroin into their vein can now take it as a pill. Now it doesn't have the same effect as obviously shooting it in your vein, but nonetheless they've become creative in the way they create this distribution mechanism. So let's talk about the good guy. Okay? These are our patients. These are my patients. These are the folks that are addicted. And what you have to remember is that in almost every case that we've been able to investigate, their opioid addiction started with a prescription from a health care provider. 
in almost every case. And more than likely, it was legitimate, right? They went in there, they hurt their knee, their shoulder, their elbow, their finger, whatever, and they got a prescription. Unfortunately, us as healthcare providers, we're not really taught the proper way to distribute or dispense these medications. I can tell you how I learned, right? The senior doctor that was teaching me said, write this prescription, give them 30 pills. Yes, sir. That's what I did. Okay, simple as that. No science, no mechanism. Uh, unlike what I learned when I write you an antibiotic, right? I know what antibiotic to put you on. I know how often you take it every day, and I know how many days to take it for because we've scientifically proven that's how you take the antibiotic, okay? So oftentimes these people would leave with their elbow pain or their knee pain, right? And they would be walking out with a bucket full of pain pills, okay? And they would either use them, sell them, or maybe they'd throw them away. Or maybe somebody else would get, uh, get, get into them and create a problem. So um, the other part is when we cut them off from their prescriptions, what happens? They go to the illicit side of the equation. Try to get the pills on the street. When those aren't available, what do they do after that? They go for heroin or other drugs like fentanyl that we'll talk about in a second. And then obviously death follows because of overdose. So these are the good guys or the patients. Let's talk about solutions. I like to break it down into three solutions because it, it's easier for my mind to wrap around. There are three things we have to do. Number one, we have to control the illicit drug market. Okay? Now, there may not, unless there's anybody in the room from DEA or high federal agency, this may seem a little bit out of our grasp. But nonetheless, we have to shut down all the illicit drugs coming into our country. Because if we don't, it doesn't matter what we do with any of the rest of this, if they still have access to illicit drugs, they are going to use illicit drugs. The temptation is too high. Okay? The second part is, is you have to, be, us as healthcare providers, have to be more responsible prescribers. Okay? You no longer need to leave a doctor's office with a bucket of opioids, right? Okay? Maybe you don't need an opioid at all. Maybe there are other alternatives, other medications that will work better. Okay? Or maybe just nothing. Right? Because sometimes you just have to get out of bed and hurt for a few minutes and then we're good to go. Okay? I like to call that one suck it up buttercup, right? Okay? <laughs> that trigger. I'm not saying that's the only thing and I'm, I, you know, I, that may sound crass, but the point is, is a good conversation between a healthcare provider and their patient allows for good pain management, not just a bucket of opioids. The middle of these solutions is the patient, okay? The person that's addicted, the ones we're talking about. That's challenging. Because I know right now, if you have high blood pressure, I can put you on a high blood pressure pill, probably get you better, you'll be feeling fine, and you'll just need to come see me every six, eight months, and we'll do a checkup, okay? But if you have an opioid addiction, there is no cookie-cutter treatment to that opioid addiction, meaning it's different for everybody. Some people need months of therapy. Some people need years of therapy, okay? Uh, so that's what makes it so difficult. If we specifically look at it, it is complicated. Unless you're with the DEA or some kind of federal drug enforcement agency, you probably can't handle much to do with you know, stopping the Mexican cartels. Probably can't do that, okay? Uh, you certainly could advocate for it. Uh, we could advocate for stricter rules, maybe, uh, for the cartels when they do bring uh, heroin into our community. Say, yeah, you know what? We don't tolerate that in Louisiana. Um, so managing the bad guy in those scenarios. From a responsible prescribing standpoint, two years ago the Louisiana legislature actually made some good strides in doing that. They passed these two acts, you can see 82 and 76, and these were responsible prescribing legislation. And what they said was, is from now on in the treatment of acute pain, somebody that's got pain and it's immediate, there are several things that have to take place. Number one, if me as a clinician decide to put you on an opioid pain pill, I have to tell you I'm going to put you on an opioid pain pill and it's dangerous. You might become addicted to it, right? So it puts some power back in the patient's hands so the patient can say, eh, maybe I don't want to do that, okay? However, if we choose to do that, the second step to that is, is you go to the pharmacy, the pharmacist now has to tell you, this is an opioid pain script, okay? It might be bad, you might get addicted to it, do you still want it? The next step to that was, is I cannot write you more than seven days. And so a lot of times you think, well, why seven days? Well, the science, right, because we're scientists, the science and the literature say opioids really don't even work after three days, okay? So the negotiation with the legislature was seven, uh, and I won't, I won't bore you with the details, but nonetheless, you can see it's better than an endless supply, okay? Um, when you get to the prescription, when you get to the pharmacy with that prescription for seven days, you can get a partial fill of it. So if you get scared by what the doctor says and what the pharmacist says, thinking, oh my gosh, this is an opioid thing, and I heard Dr. Clark speak at Rotary and it was scaring me, you can only get three days filled if you want to, okay? And if the, after three days you still need pain medicine, 
go back to the same pharmacist and you can get the remainder of the prescription done. Okay? So again, more power to the person who's going to take the medication. All right? The last piece of that was there is a fail safe. If for some strange reason you need more than seven days, a healthcare provider has to document in their chart why I'm going beyond seven days and I'm mandated to look you up in the prescription monitoring program to prevent a diversion scenario or a doctor shopping scenario. Okay? And I have to document that I did log in. And by the way, the prescription monitoring program, because it's a database, they can see when I log in. Right? So they know on the back side whether I did what I was supposed to. The last piece was requiring all prescribers to do continuing education specific for opioids. So you remember the story I told you about how I learned how to write an opioid prescription? Now we really learn how to write one. Right? We look at the science behind it and when to use it and when not to use it. So that's how we handle the responsible prescribing. The last piece that I'll talk about treating of the addict. Remember I said that the addict is not only medically addicted to the medicine, meaning the opioid, they need it physically, their body craves it, but they are also psychologically addicted, neurochemically, in their brain. So in order to treat them, you have to do two things. Number one, you have to medically treat them. And we do that oftentimes by putting people on what we call long-lasting long opioids like methadone, which is an older one, a newer one is Suboxone. And essentially what you want to do is put them on that medication and then begin to taper them. Because at some point in their future, they need to be on no opioids whatsoever. The problem is, like I said, it's not a cookie cutter. I can't tell you, well, that lasts a month or that lasts six months or whatever the case may be. But the point is, is they have to have a medical taper. Beyond that is working what's going on in their brain, neurochemically. Why are they addicted? And we call the treatment of that cognitive behavioral therapy. You have to do both together or it's pointless. Cognitive behavioral therapy without medically assisted treatment doesn't work. Medically assisted treatment without cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't work. What is so complicated about these two forms of treatment is that they're expensive, okay? And typically insurances don't cover any of this stuff, okay? So if you don't have any money, zero, and we, if you're an indi part of the indigent population, you don't have access to it, right? So what do you do? You try to get through your addiction in a really, really hard, hard way. So, Well, let me tell you about the next chapter. The next chapter is fentanyl. You might have heard of this drug. It's a synthetic opioid. Okay? So I got curious about fentanyl specifically because typically when we investigate opioid overdoses in East Baton Rouge Parish, all of them are multi-drug overdoses, meaning not everybody takes just one drug. They don't just take heroin and that's it and that's what kills them. They typically take a bunch of drugs. Usually depressants are the ones that kill them. So they take heroin, they throw in some uh, uh, opioid pills with that. They might take a muscle relaxer, drink some alcohol, everything to slow down their system and that's what kills them. We had a particular case a couple of years back uh, where we had a gentleman who had died. The death scene clearly looked like a drug overdose. Okay, He was in a, a locked room. Uh, he had all the signs that we see in a, in a death scene of a drug overdose. Uh, we had a conversation with his sister and she told us this. She said, you know what? One day we knew cocaine was going to take his life. That was his drug of choice. He used cocaine ever since we could remember. And we knew one day we would find him dead as a result of it. So clearly, when we're working this case and we do the toxicology, by the way, which takes about 21 days to get toxicology back, despite what you see on CSI, like, like a commercial break, it takes a bit longer. But in 21 days, I'm expecting to see a massive cocaine overdose. We get the tox back. There's one drug and one drug only in his system, and it's fentanyl. Okay? And you say, well, how did that happen? Why all of a sudden would a guy who abused cocaine his entire life would start to use fentanyl? Okay? And I think the answer is really simple. I think he went to his drug dealer uh, and he said, you know, I, I need my drugs. And they gave him some white powder and he went home and he used it, right? And it was all fentanyl. And he had no idea. And that's when I said, we need to go back and look at our statistics and see where fentanyl came on the scene. Because we saw where heroin came on the scene, but where did fentanyl come? So that's what led to this analysis. And so you remember this chart that I showed you a second ago. There is your heroin. Here's your fentanyl. About 2015, 2016, we saw it seeing it. The bad news, the bad news, is if you remember, if I pull up all the overdoses, right, this chart right here, which is everything, and you say, oh, well, we went from 2017, 111 overdoses, down to 102 in 2018, so maybe things are getting better. But what I want you to do is look at the yellow. Fentanyl went from 12 to 32. What got better? We reduced the number of non-opioid overdoses. 
but opioid overdoses are still on the climb, okay? And what's concerning is the fact that fentanyl is involved in this, and fentanyl is very, very dangerous. So I'm going to wrap things up real quick. There is a concern of weaponizing opioids, uh, and so that exists today. Uh, this stuff is so powerful. They even have a drug called carfentanil. Uh, a, couple of, a couple of granules out of that shawl shaker right there is enough to kill everybody in the room. Uh, so there's concerns of how that could be used uh, against, uh, against our populace. Um, and then lastly, uh, people have heard about Narcan. Uh, they talk about it as the miracle drug. Narcan's been around for quite some time. Uh, we've used it really in the, in the, in the uh, medical uh, community, in the medical arenas. But now it has become uh, available to the general public. Uh, so uh, we're saving lives with it. Uh, but we've got to remember, if somebody uses Narcan, they're using it because they're addicted to an opioid. Uh, so there's a next step, right, which is tr let's get them help uh, for their addiction. So I'll leave you with that, and I'm happy, happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. So you, you described how the, how the demand can we Can we stop the supply? Because there's a lot of talk right now of whether or not, is it on? I think you can hear me. Yeah. About whether or not we need to secure the border or not secure the border. So my we, question we to, to you is, it's on, put it close to your mouth, put it close to your mouth. It is. Can we, can we stop the supply? I think I heard you say that, but I, I, I want to ask again, can we do more to stop the supply that coming into this country? So it's my belief we can. I think we can. And so, and especially, I mean, if you go back to what I said about what the Louisiana legislature said about nonviolent drug offenders, if you sell opioids, specifically heroin or fentanyl, you're a violent drug offender at the end of the day. Uh, because those are the folks that, uh, you know, at the end of every one of those sales is a person who's going to use the drug and is going to die as a result of it. So I don't think we have any choice uh, but to do everything in our power to secure the border and prevent this stuff from coming over. See, I believe that, but, but that's not what we're here. Mm. Okay, yeah. so, so the next question is, look, you're dear to this. I, I mean, you, you I like your donut store. <laughs> uh, because you told us what would happen if you did. But what, what do we need to say to these people to get off the politics and fix the problem? Yeah, it's tough. So, uh, you know, I think one of the big issues is going to be a funding issue when it comes to doing what we need to do for the addicts, our, our patients. Uh, right now there are a lot of uh, lawsuits. Everybody has seen these lawsuits that are floating around against uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and it reminds us so much of big tobacco when that happened. Uh, and so eventually it's my opinion that one day we will have uh, there will be a payout, right? The state will get money, the parish will get money, and so forth and so on. What's going to be very important for us as a community is what we do with that money, okay? And so we have a lot of options, but really, if you ask me, 100% of it should be poured into treatment because that's the one thing people can't get right now because they can't afford it. So we have to pour it into treatment because I can go around and talk about people and educate you about opioids all day. I do it, I do it all the time, and I do it for free. Uh, so, uh, but we have to treat those people, and that really becomes the crux of the, of, of the solution. So, yes, sir. Here. Can you scream? Hi, Dr. Clark. Uh, Lauren Fowler with Blue Cross Foundation. So, we travel statewide, and we have a lot of nonprofits who come to us, and they want to do work around the opioid crisis. They want to be involved. In your opinion, what can nonprofit and community organizations do in this arena to make a difference? What, what can they do? Right, so uh, certainly from an education standpoint, you can have people speak and educate your community. I really am kind of surprised. I've been talking about this for several years now, and I still uh, talk to people sometimes, and they're like, I had no idea, right? You know, uh, I even talk to people in the healthcare arena that maybe no, don't even know that you know this drug is an opioid, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you're in the healthcare arena, you don't even know that's an opioid. Uh, so I, I don't think we're done from an education standpoint. Uh, certainly, the ability to pay for uh, for uh, someone's uh, addiction therapy uh, becomes very challenging, uh, and because it costs a lot of money, and there's no program, but I think nonprofits can play a role in trying to uh, uh, establish uh, uh, places for people to, to get that kind of access. Uh, because it really becomes an access problem at the end of the day. So, thanks. Yes, sir. There was a wonderful article in the paper this morning, ironically, that you're speaking today about Oklahoma getting some lawsuit from this lovely company that owns the right. or whatever. Right. Yeah, I haven't heard, I haven't read about that, but I mean, I, I imagine it's on, it's, it's coming soon, right? I mean, eventually they're going to settle all these or there will be a payout. The only thing that I heard recently that I was a little disheartened by is the fact that uh, Purdue Pharma, who's kind of the big one here, uh, is considering filing bankruptcy, 
which will seize up kind of what's going on in a legal fashion. I don't know how for how long, uh, but they're probably trying to protect their assets, I imagine. Yeah. So, yeah. Was there somebody else? I th you had a question over here. Right. I'm sorry. If all these drugs are bad, but being prescribed for treatment pain management, if you do away with them. What is going to take its place and why aren't they using it now? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. What do we do, right? So I think uh, more research needs to be done on the proper use of opioids because I don't want to stand up here and say, you know, if somebody's got terminal bone cancer and they're suffering in pain, we should do nothing for them. Obviously, we should be humane uh, in, in their treatment. Uh, but, you know, for somebody that twists their ankle, do they need a bucket of lore tab, right? I mean, you know, we can determine the difference. Now, the other question is, is and I know of research is happening right now, of are there drugs or other drugs that exist uh, uh, that maybe work better or are just as good? Or they're like an opioid, but they don't have the euphoria and the central nervous depression and all the things of addiction that we worry about. So I think more research and finding a drug, I mean, there, there, there may be a wonder drug out there that, that does all the good things you want from an opioid and none of the bad. And so if we had something like that, that would be an awesome alternative. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.